Hello, my name is Guillermo Gallego and in these videos we will take a look at tracking with event-based cameras, possibly in combination with standard cameras. We will see a progression of the trackers for different shapes and different uh, scenarios. Okay, so let's start with the blob cluster tracking. So imagine that we have a camera that is static. Uh, for example, this one that it's on top of a bridge in the highway and it's observing some of the cars or trucks passing by, right? So in this scenario, all the events generated by the camera are due to moving objects in the scene. There is little change in illumination, so most of the objects come from moving edges in the scene. Such as this one. Right? You can see the different objects. Okay, so the idea is... Um, um, can we devise a simple tracker that makes a good use of the events and it's very efficient to track uh, these objects? Well, the simplest one is that we treat the objects as simply blob of clouds of events. And we have a very simple tracker where we just update maybe the, the location of the tracker and the size. But you see these are like, it's a generic tracker, sometimes my wiggle. And there is no such a thing as a concept of, uh, of an object. Maybe we can assign two or more of these uh, bounding boxes that we see in the video, like here, to, to one of the cars. Well, so this is a very efficient tracker and this has applications in, in surveillance. For example, you, you would like this tracker to count the cars and maybe measure their speed. Another example is uh, when you have a, a camera that is um, static, for example, in, the, in a hall of a hotel and you are tracking, this is just an example to track people and you don't want to uh, waste a lot of energy. So you have a very low power sensor such as an event camera that is triggering all these events are mostly they are triggered uh, by the moving objects, right? The, we are showing the grayscale output, which is the uh, frames every few hertz, 1.32 hertz, as you can see in the video. But um, all the information about, most of the information that comes about moving objects comes in the form of events. And for these events, we just cluster them and we put a bounding box around them. And then we can plot the history of that bounding box, where was the center of that bounding box. So as you can see in this static scenario that we've seen in these two videos, uh, the camera is static. Uh, most of the events are due to the moving objects and for that event cameras are very powerful sensor because they are doing background subtraction in the sensor and we just need to care about um, classifying maybe the, the different events uh, from which cluster from which object it comes and uh, once it's classified then track it or update the parameters of the of the cluster. So sometimes it doesn't work so well, right? There was like a, a change of direction here. It said that this cluster came left and then there was a crossing and then the cluster came, but this is a different object. Okay, so yeah, this blob or cluster tracking where we are just simply uh, considering that the events are like a, a blob, uh, a cloud of, uh, of points, and then we want to follow them. Uh, well, it can be used for surveillance and here objects are cr crudely re represented by Gaussians or boxes or whatever. So on the left, you see an image, a top view um, of, a, of a corridor and people are moving out of the room. And on the right, you see a grayscale representation of the events, uh, the brightness changes, the positive events in white, negative events in dark. And we also have the information of the different trackers, so the ID of the track and the velocity uh, and direction in which the object is moving. So how are events processed? Well, typically one by one, and that's the paradigm shift, right? Because now we are not processing images, uh, full images. Uh, when they come, we just process the events. And even though I have represented the events here with this grayscale image, this is just a representation. Events are processed, in this case, they are treated as single events, so as points on the image plane, and only the locations where um, 
in the pixels where an event uh, was triggered, that's the location that it's processed. That's what it means by one by one. Um, so there are two steps. One is uh, that the events are assigned to clusters. Like you can see here, if an event happens, you have to decide which object or cluster it belongs to. And this is usually done based on spatial vicinity. So which one is, the, what is for, the, for this given event, what is the closest cluster? And then once you have assigned the event to the cluster, what you have to do is that you have to update the cluster parameters, such as the center, the size, the velocity, uh, to fit with the events. And what is happening is that basically the event is dragging this, this cluster. The new event is kind of pulling uh, the cluster to, to its location. And that's what's represented kind of in the top right uh, sign. So you have an event, in this case, this red dot, and a cluster is represented by this <clears throat> center XT. And then <clears throat> we update the centroid of that cluster, which at time T plus delta T, that's what it will be. And it's kind of pointing a bit dragged <clears throat> by the event in the direction of the event. So in a sense, it's <clears throat> it's like a filter. It's um, it's acting uh, on every single measurement that comes asynchronously, and it's updating some parameters. In this case, the state would be the the par parameters of the of the blob of the cluster. So there are two key ingredients uh, in tracking methods that are also present. In, in other trackers, and it's it's worth to take a look at them and uh, and think about them. One of them is data association, and it's the following question: um, To which cluster does this event belong to? Right, we are processing each event independently. Then we have an incoming event, and we ask, okay, this event that is kind of isolated, it's new. Um, where to which object to which cluster does it belong? And the answer to, to this question would be that we need to kind of come up with a function that assigns events to tracked objects or clusters. That's the data association. The second key ingredient is that we need an update rule. We have an event, we have assigned the event to a cluster, we know uh, the association between them, and now we have to say, okay, how are the model parameters of the parameters of the object updated to assimilate the information given by this new event. And the answer is that we need to come up with a function that updates the model or its parameters, which are the desired, typically the desired output of the tracker. Basically, we have a new event, we have assigned it to a tracker, and now we have to say, okay, how, what's the new information that the event brings us to um, update uh, the parameters of the model? And this update rule, typically what it happens is that <clears throat> it could be a heuristic or it could be more focused on trying to minimize some, uh, some objective function, some criterion. Okay, so we have seen these two. In the, in the case of the blob tracker, the data association is that we assign it to the nearest blob and the update rule is just simply like we are dragging the centroid and maybe moving the size. Uh, Sorry, increasing the size or decreasing the size of the blob, depends. Let's take a look at it in a bit more detail um, because it's important to understand this, this change of paradigm that we are not processing images, we are processing events one by one, so event by event. Imagine that um, we have a scene on the left. There is a person, right? Uh, and it's moving towards the left. That's what the arrow indicates. This is the, the sensor, so the pixel array. And we are at some point, um, forget about the initialization for now, and we are at time t k minus one, and we have an internal state. And this internal state will, will be the additional information that goes into the algorithm. <clears throat> so in this case, this state could be given or could be built from past events. Okay, so at time uh, k minus one, so when we process the event k minus one, we have an internal state that is represented by kind of like a blob shape. You can see kind of this 
contours it's it's like a gaussian right and uh, this state consists of uh, actually three numbers two numbers are the centroid because this is a point in the xy plane <clears throat> and the third number is the size of the of the of the blob so in this case we consider that it's an isotropic gaussian <clears throat> and it's only one parameter to control the <clears throat> the width of this of this blob okay so then what happens is that uh, the object was moving so the person that it's kind of black it's dark here it's moving towards the left and therefore there was a pixel that it was bright and now it became dark and so it was an off event and this event has an x y location t for the timestamp and p for the polarity and this event uh, is going to be passed to the tracking algorithm and we want the tracking algorithm to process that event taking into account uh, the in information in its internal state <clears throat> So what it will do is that, well, now we have already done the assignment. We have said that this event comes to from this cluster, step one. And then in step two, what we need is an update rule. So what we do is that we update uh, the state of the block. Basically, we said what is the, what's the location of the new centroid and the new size of the block based on what was previously there, so the internal state and uh, new information and this new information comes from from the new event right so this delta x delta y could be <clears throat> a vector pointing uh, in the direction between the centroid of the blob and the new event but it could be any other rule okay and this produces an output that maybe we are only interested in the location of the of uh, the object then we just simply up output the, the centroid we don't need to update the, the size um, and once this output has been generated then we kind of move uh, the internal state so the we have to update the internal state now with the what we have computed in the tracking algorithm as you can see from the previous image it has moved right a bit in the direction of the event and now we are ready for the next event to come that's basically that's the the processing uh, pipeline or algorithm um, so that was just an example let me show one of these um, um, applications applications of uh, such a simple tracker but you can tailor it to the scenario at hand and then you can uh, find yeah you can uh, say that you want the the object to be of the the same size and you know exactly where the object is going to be like here in this uh, car racing uh, game so let's take a look there is a no uh, there is a camera uh, looking at the at the circuit at the race and it's observing the two cars by the way, the YouTube link should be here at the bottom. Um, so there is there are two cars, right? One is controlled by uh, the white one is controlled by the machine, and the red one is controlled by the human. In this case, Toby Delbrook is playing with it. And um, the the camera that it's above is watching both cars, right? And even though for the for us this is quite a high speed uh, scene. Uh, the camera has a very high temporal resolution, so it's able to track these objects with uh, uh, with quite temporal precision. So in a minute, we will see that this circuit that we see here is uh, mapped uh, on the screen of the of a computer, and the screen is showing how the tracking algorithm works. Um, and it's tracking the white one and then it's able to uh, to control the the car to beat the the human pilot in this case the human controller in this case it's quite a simple tracker right it's one of the block trackers that we have seen um, very simple one on every event is updating the the state of the system um, I can move 
folder. Yeah, here you can see the two cars moving. And in a minute we will see uh, the blobs. Yeah, so here are the, the trackers. So you can see they are very simple ones. So the, the rectangle is kind of the region of interest for that tracker. So the events that are falling into those uh, that square, they are used to update the tracker. And the tracker can go uh, down to processing really few events. And you see here is slow down and it's, it's wiggled back and forth depending on the events. This is really like a slow motion, slow down the video to see the details. But there are, I don't know if it's easy to see, there are events and they're kind of popping in red and green in, in this box and they are used to update uh, this track. And in this case, you can say more. You can say, well, I know uh, this is the, the track so where the car is going to be. Uh, so I, in principle, I should only take a look at events that happen um, around this contour. So I can focus and I can say, let's only take a look at this. And there are actually two, one for each car. And therefore here, yeah, you can distinguish the events that are coming from each car. So even though this is a simple tracker, you can tailor it to your needs, uh, to the specific scenario that you have, and then you can come up with a very fast, uh, efficient algorithm uh, tracker. Yeah. So what are the advantages and disadvantages um, of this type of uh, cluster tracker? Well, it's very efficient. So the advantages is that it's very efficient because we are not wasting resources, computational resources or effort on pixels with no events. It's quite easy to implement. It's, you know, just an event counts and then we have to compute the, the direction of where to move the centroid, for example, or how to change the orientation. It's very intuitive geometrically in 2D. And, and because we are processing one event at a time, it has very low latency, in principle, minimal latency, down to in the order of microseconds. The disadvantages are that, well, this is just a rough approximation, a very simplification of the shape. Uh, there is no concept of object. Uh, so in the, in the example of the car being tracked on the highway, there, is, there are no clear boundaries. You could assign several of these blob trackers to a single car, even though we know that it's a single track. So there is no such thing as like a common boundary. Unless is, it is enforced uh, by a constraint scenario, such as the one in the slot car racing and uh, there is jitter and wiggling because events are coming uh, asynchronously and at different locations so maybe you are first telling the tracker to go uh, left and then telling it to go right when well, in principle they are all going to the left but you know uh, events happen asynchronously and, um, and there is also noise so the, this jitter or wiggling that comes from, uh, from processing every event independently in principle it, should, it could be done just by uh, by adding some uh, low pass filter to the movement of the centroid and then problems arise if objects cross each other and this is something that we have seen in the in the video of the camera uh, looking at the, um, the whole of the of the hotel Okay, so this was a very simple tracker and it was good to tell us uh, how the, this paradigm shift uh, uh, works, right? Processing each event. And now the next question that we have is, uh, can we design more complex uh, trackers to go to, the, to track more complex shapes?